in both of these moments, the Lord achieves his recognition through another consciousness. For in them, that other consciousness is expressively something unessential, both by its working on the thing and by its dependence on a specific existence. In neither case can it be lord over the being of the thing and achieve absolute negation of it. Here, therefore, is present this moment of recognition, that is, that the other consciousness sets aside its own being for self, and in so doing itself does what the first does to it. Similarly, the other moment to is present, that this action of the second is the first's own action, for what the bondsman does is really the action of the Lord. The latter's essential nature is to exist only for himself. He is a sheer negative power for whom the thing is nothing. Thus he is the pure, honest, the pure essential action in this relationship, while the action of the bondsman is impure and unessential. But for recognition proper, the moment is lacking, that what the Lord does to the other, he also does to himself, and what the bondsman does to himself, he should also do to the other. The outcome is a recognition that is one-sided and unequal. The absolutely key issue that's arising in paragraph 191 and then moving through the other paragraphs is this question of recognition. Is the master getting what he or she most truly desires, which is not just enjoyment of the world of objects, not just to get to boss somebody around, but to have this recognition that we saw is at the, the core of self-consciousness and at the bottom of our desires, at least for Hegel. So the question has to be put by working through what the relationship of the Lord, the master, the slave, and the thing actually turn out to be. At first it looks like the, the master is getting everything that he or she wants. This is perfect. He's in the top dog position. He gets to tell the slave what to do. He even gets to decide what thing the slave is going to work on, how long the slave is going to work, what constitutes good performance, bad performance, gets to punish the slave if the slave doesn't do what, what he wants, um, gets to you know, reward the slave if, if he or she decides that, it, that the slave is worth it. So it sounds pretty good for the master. But we're already going to see the beginnings of the shift that's taking place, that's underlying this entire dialectic. He says, in both these moments, the Lord achieves his recognition through another consciousness, right? In both of these moments refers back to the last paragraph. So in them, that other consciousness, he says, is expressively something unessential. The slave is less than a person. The slave is a person that you can make do your bidding, that you can bend to your will. Why? Both by its working on the thing, the slave is in a subordinate position, by being made as a human being to engage with the non-human world uh, that, that requires labor, that requires some cultivation in order to make it accessible to our desires as human beings. Uh, and by its dependence on a specific existence. The slave, remember, was the one who gave in and said, uh, slavery is better than dying. Uh, I'd rather serve than, you know, risk complete annihilation. Their specific existence is what they valued most. And as we saw, there's a paradox there because they don't get to enjoy their specific existence. Instead, they're forced to expend their life, their labor, doing this work for the master. So he says, um, in neither case can the, the servant be the lord over the being of the thing and achieve absolute negation. We just saw this already. The servant is not allowed to enjoy the thing the way that the master is. The master is the one who gets the cream of the crop. The master is the one who gets the first fruits. Um, unless they want to give it to another master, as was often done in religious rituals, right? First fruits. So he says, here, therefore, is present this moment of recognition. And what's the moment of recognition? Well, there's two aspects to it. This goes back to the discussions that we saw earlier on in this section about the way in which self-consciousnesses 
engage with each other. What is the recognition that they're actually looking for? There's, uh, you might say, a sort of interpenetration of the two self-consciousnesses. They <clears throat> end up having a recipro reciprocal relation where, as Hegel says, what one does to oneself is what the other is doing to one, and what one is doing to the other is what one is doing to oneself. So there's what seems to be an equal playing field, as we call it, a kind of equalization or a, a leveling of things. But we don't have that in the master and slave. Instead, it's actually, as Hegel says, one-sided, right? Uh, whenever things are one-sided, that's always a sign, just like whenever you see the word immediate, look out because something is going to be coming up that's going to require us to go beyond that. So how is the slave? The slave is doing the, the work of recognition. The master is not. Now, what makes this really interesting is that the master can't really get recognition if the master is not willing to do some of the work him or herself. We'll see how that, that comes about. So he says, here's, here's present this moment of recognition. The other consciousness sets aside its own being for self. Like I said, the slave, once it's placed in this dependent condition, doesn't get to decide for itself what it's going to be. You know, if the slave is, is supposed to be blowing glass, the slave doesn't get to say, you know, I think I'd much rather be a musician. The master then comes along and says, Knock it off, you're blowing glass. Um, the slave does not get to set his or her own hours, does not get to determine the conditions under which he or she lives. They lack freedom, in other words. They lack the real freedom that comes with determining what kind of existence, what kind of being for self, what kind of self-identity one is going to have. Even being able to, to experiment with this or being able to pose it as a project. Sometimes the slaves might say, you know, I, I don't think that I should be breaking rocks all day to make gravel for these roads. In some cases, the master will say, all right, you're getting punished just for even bringing that up. That's how, um, you know, extensive the, the estrangement, the alienation of the slave is going to be. So, like he says, um, the, uh, the other consciousness sets aside its own being for self, and in doing so, does what the first does to it. This is important. Why does the slave have to set aside its own being for self? Because the master requires that. Because the master commands that. Because the master determines that for the slave. So he says... Um, Similarly, the other moment to his present. The action of the second is the first's own action. So here we have, what is the action of the slave? The action is work. Work upon the thing. And it appears to be something that the slave can at least say, well, this is my own action, right? But it's really the Lord's action. The Lord is more fundamental. The master. The master is, is the one who says, you're going to go out there and farm those fields, or you're going to start sweeping this dirty room, and if you, if you want to give me any guff, you're not going to like what happens afterwards. Um, the slave, by him or herself, is not choosing to work upon the thing, to transform the thing into an object of desire and an object of enjoyment for the master. So it's really the Lord's action that's taking place within the slave. So he says... Um, the latter is essential nature, the Lord. So here, here we have a couple things that, that Hegel tells us about the master of the Lord. His essential nature is to exist only for himself. Nobody else, except perhaps another master, gets to tell the master what to do. Slaves certainly don't get to tell the master what to do. They just get to say, well, you know, if you want the job done this way, I think I need a new broom. Or you're probably going to need to buy some more cooking oil if you want this stuff cooked. Or we're going to need some vinegar if you want this, this uh, crop preserved in, in, in glass jars for yourself. The master doesn't, he's not subject to anything like that. He doesn't suffer any of those sorts of constraints. He exists only for himself, as Hegel says. 
he is, as he says, the sheer negative power for whom the thing is nothing. We've already seen this. Another way of talking about that is the master is freedom, absolute freedom, at least at this stage. The master can uh, decide what to do with the thing. Uh, the master could say, let's burn down the fields. Or, you know, uh, this house is too messy, let's just destroy it. The master probably won't do that, but that's within their purview. The slave, <laughs> imagine if the slave says, I don't want to farm these fields, let me just burn them up. You know, that's not going to fly in this sort of arrangement, is it? The master, however, does have the capacity to negate whatever they want. They have the freedom to make things otherwise. And any freedom, it seems, that the slave has to make things otherwise through their work is coming through the initiative of the master. So the master determines what the work is, and in this process is receiving a one-sided recognition from the slave in what the slave is doing with the object, with the thing, with the, the locus of, of work, the locus of, of activity. So he says, um, the action of the bondsman is impure and inessential. And think for a moment the way that we, even today, and again, I don't want to say we want to generalize too much, I'm not saying that managerial relationships are relationships of master and slave, but there is something analogous going on here. When the boss takes the credit for the work that the workers do, for, for what they accomplish, because the boss is the one who gets to write the report the one who gets to give the narrative of what actually took place to appropriate the, the uh, transformed objects of labor that the workers do, we have something like what Hegel is describing here. The action of the bondsman is considered impure, inessential. It's not really that important. I, I brought up Aristotle a number of points here. Aristotle establishes a kind of hierarchy, the one who's calling the shots, the one who is engaging and determining things with that Greek word archaine that I've brought up a couple times. I should write that down here. Um, you know, if we want to use this in terms of, of Greek terms, um, archaine, to rule, to dominate, to be in charge. The person who's in charge, their action is seen as being essential as the action that puts other action into process, that guides it, that, that, that orients it, that sets, as I've said, the agenda. Um, the work of the slave, the labor, the activity, is seen as being inessential, as being, in a certain respect, almost less than human, as being brutish, as being random. So can you actually get recognition out of this? Well, Hegel says, for recognition proper, the moment is lacking. That what the Lord does to the other, he also does to himself. The Lord does not treat himself as a servant. Now, it could be that you could have lords who you know, have great self-discipline and, and do treat themselves that way. But that's not what he's talking about at this point. The Lord... Um, ought to do to the other what he does to himself, and what the bondsman does to himself, he should also do to the other. The master is not allowing the slave to do that, the, or lord, or, or you know, bondsman, if you, if you like that. Um, what, the, what the slave is doing is really coming from the master and not the other way around. So he says, the outcome is a recognition that is one-sided and unequal. And the question then is, is that sort of recognition what it is that the master really had a desire for? In this recognition, the unessential consciousness is for the Lord the object, which constitutes the truth of his certainty of himself. But it is clear that this object does not correspond to its notion, but rather that the object in which the Lord has achieved his lordship has in reality turned out to be something quite different from an independent consciousness. What now really confronts him is not an independent consciousness, but a dependent one. He is therefore not certain of being for self as the truth of himself. On the contrary, his truth is in reality the unessential consciousness and its unessential action.
Now in paragraph 192, we're starting to see the importance and the initiative shift from the side of the master to that of the slave. It's not going to occur as such in this paragraph, but it will happen in the next paragraph. But here Hegel is setting it up. Remember the, the worry that we saw at the, la at the end of the last paragraph, uh, number 191. Now in number 192 he says, in this recognition, the unessential consciousness, the servant, the slave, is for the Lord the object which constitutes the truth of his certainty of himself. And that is what the Lord has been seeking. That is what the master has been looking. What every self-consciousness actually desires is to have a self-certainty that is also a true self-certainty, one that is recognized by another and freely recognized, reciprocally recognized by another. So what the Lord is really desiring is some other independent self-consciousness as their object with which they can have a, or with whom rather, they can have a reciprocal relation, a full recognition which gives them the truth of their self-certainty, not only uh, in this direction, but also the master would be giving it in this direction. You might say, well, can't the class of masters do that for themselves? Hegel doesn't really consider that as a possibility at this point, and we'll, we'll see why that can't be the case in, in just a little bit. So this doesn't happen. Instead, the object of the master's desire of what it is that, that he or she is really seeking is the slave, and the relationship is one of ruling, of setting them to work. And so we have this whole complex of the slave working upon the thing, um, this is not going to provide the kind of recognition that the master wants. Like he says, it's clear this object does not correspond to its notion. What is its notion? Another independent self-consciousness. By the sheer fact of subjugating and ruling, dominating the slave, making the slave be, in effect, a means to an end, a tool for one's own desires, one places the slave into a condition that the slave is not going to be particularly <laughs> happy about to begin with, right? But also that can't give the master what it is that he or she really desires out of the relationship. That is an equal relation. When you subjugate somebody, you are placing them below yourself. You are treating them as less than you and therefore you can't also treat them and expect them to, to treat you as an equal in return. I mean, you can, you can uh, this is something worth thinking about, you can create all sorts of double binds for your slaves, right? You can say, be spontaneous, just tell me what's on your mind. Um, you know, don't treat me like a master, just treat me like I'm just one of your, your fellow slaves. And that might work for a little bit, but as soon as a slave starts to really exercise the freedom that seems to be involved in that, the master will then say, oh, I don't really, that wasn't what I expected from you. I don't really want that. But without that risk, without that openness, you can't get real recognition like the master wants to get. So he says, uh, it's, it's that the object which the Lord has achieved as lordship has in reality to turn out to be something quite different from an independent consciousness. It's a dependent consciousness. Uh, the Lord is the one who the, the, the dependent consciousness depends upon for its, its you know, purpose, for its meaning, for its activity. And so he says, he is therefore not certain of being for self as the truth of himself. So the Lord doesn't get this truth of self-certainty, truth and self-certainty together. Instead, they do have self-certainty. They are the one who gets to feel like they are in charge, like they know who they are. But there's always going to be some, some lacunae, some, some gaps, some shadows, some doubts. And the truth is going to lie on the side of the servant. 
This is an incredibly important transformative moment in the dialectic. The truth of the master doesn't reside in the master or in his or her mastery of the slave. Instead, the truth is found over here in the world of independent objects and in the activity of the slave upon those independent objects. So there's a kind of sundering. You can't have them further apart from each other. Uh, you might say it's just fortunate that I happened to depict it on the chalkboard that way. So he says, his truth is in reality the unessential consciousness. The truth of the master is the slave and the activity of the slave and the world that the slave engages. So the master doesn't possess his or her own truth because of being a master and ruling out this other relationship. It also lies in the unessential consciousness's unessential action. This is very revolutionary. This is a fundamentally transformative moment. The truth of the independent consciousness is accordingly the servile consciousness of the bondman. This, it is true, appears at first outside of itself and not as the truth of self-consciousness. But, just as lordship showed that its essential nature is the reverse of what it wants to be, so too, servitude in its consummation will really turn into an opposite of what it immediately is. As a consciousness forced back into itself, it will withdraw into itself and be transformed into a truly independent consciousness. In paragraphs 191 and 192, Hegel was setting us up for a pivotal shift, and this is now going to happen in paragraph 193, but as usual, it's not going to happen all at once. We're going to see the very first beginnings of it, but this is a transitional point. He says, the truth of the independent self-consciousness is accordingly the servile, the, the working, the servant, self-consciousness or consciousness of the bondsman, of the slave. So the truth that the, the master was seeking to have as something that they really want at, at the foundation, the truth of their self-consciousness, does not reside in them. It does not reside in the power that they hold. It does not reside in their action of ruling, of determining, of appropriating, of enjoying. All those things are going to turn out to be, as Hegel's going to say, less essential than what's happening over here on the part of the dependent consciousness, the slave. The truth lies on the part of the slave, and the slave is not yet conscious of that. That's going to require some further dialectical work. So he says, um, this, is, it is true, appears at first outside of itself and not as the truth of self-consciousness. See, the slave has to realize him or herself as indeed self-consciousness and not just as dependent self-consciousness. The master has been self-consciousness and sort of stressing the aspect of the independence, which both self-consciousness is originally possessed, but weren't able to fully actualize. You know, now the master is really able to, to be independent because they've got somebody else doing all the, the, the dirty work for them. And the slave feels like he or she is not really a full person. They have to work. They have to work on this world of objects. But that work is where the truth of self-consciousness, at least at this stage in the dialectic, is going to reside. So the truth gets externalized. It gets placed outside of self-consciousness. He says, um, but just as lordship showed that its essential, essential nature is the reverse of what it wants to be, the lord or the, the, the master doesn't really get the recognition that he or she desired, even though they do have rule, even though they do have power, even though they have a kind of actuality and a recognition socially, that the servant doesn't have, they're not getting the recognition, the interpersonal recognition, the deep down desire that they have. Um, just as this, this reversal took place, 
so too servitude in its consummation, he says, will really turn into the opposite of what it immediately is. We look at a servant and we say, look at that poor bastard. He is stuck working. And he, he can't really imagine anything better. You know, he'll never get out of that position. But he will. Hegel is going to chart out the process by which this reversal will occur. So he says, uh, as a consciousness forced back into itself, it will withdraw into itself and be transformed into a truly independent consciousness. How is that going to happen? By grasping that truth that is externalized, the truth of self-consciousness, externalized to itself in work, in the thing, and its relationship to that. That's what follows in the rest of this section. 